Thanks very much, Sue. And uh, let me say what an honor it is to be here. I'm very grateful to have been invited. It's been a pleasure to hear the uh, other talks, and there are more to come. Um, and I was, as I was saying to Sue, I haven't been to Ohio before, and what I have seen of it is really pretty. I'm sorry I can't uh, spend uh, more time here, but uh, out of here tomorrow. <laughs> Um, okay, I'm going to talk a bit about um, the um, scientific approach to literary studies and uh, literary experimentation. Uh, it seems to me that um, the humanities have suffered something of a problem uh, in the last few years. Uh, they've lost some of the prestige that they enjoyed three or four decades ago, um, particularly uh, in the wonderful days of um, uh, early new criticism, you know, where one was imagining one was breaking new ground. Um, uh, that has been replaced by a certain sense of uh, depression and anxiety about the future of the discipline, I think. Uh, and it's clear that um, fewer, quite a, by quite a way, I think, future uh, uh, students are registering in smaller number now, smaller numbers now, uh, for um, um, classes in, in literature and humanities. Um, uh, that's been the case in the USA, I think, for quite a while, and is certainly the case in Canada. Uh, we have experienced that as a steady decline in the English department where I worked in Alberta. Um, so fewer classroom hours are being devoted to the uh, humanities. Um, development of the personal and social value of the humanities, which this conference is exploring, uh, calls for new approaches. Uh, but here we may be running into a problem uh, given the demise of theory, you know, in, in literary studies in particular, with a theory with a capital T, the humanities are not going to be flourishing too well now under the sign of new historicism or deconstruction. Uh, the kind of, you know, the magic of those disciplines has uh, somewhat abated in recent years. Um, so the, promise, the most promising route to a renewal coming over the horizon appears to be that group of interdisciplinary approaches that have taken a scientific perspective from cognitive studies and has borrowed important elements from psychology, neuropsychology and linguistics. These disciplines represent a shift to a scientific framework for humanities study and while this has created some problems for those who have embraced it, in the case of literary study the scientific approach has raised a specific question about the validity of such study that is, whether the qualities of literature are captured. Um, uh, whether the qualities of literature are captured in the scientist's crucible. Does the literary work, in a word, retain its literariness? If the humanities and literary studies in particular are to regain the distinction that we would hope, this is an anxiety that must be addressed. So, what I call science anxiety. Uh, science approaches to literature have become a focus for some publicity, as you may have noticed, in magazines and newspapers. In some cases, this signals an interest in a renewal of the discipline, but in others, a fear that literature will be degraded, its magic dissipated. And I want to give you a, a few examples. Uh, in the New York Times for March 2010, there was a headline, Next Big Thing in English, Knowing They Know That You Know. Shades of Lisa Sunshine here. <laughs> um, and the article indeed gives an account of Lisa's work with theory of mind, uh, but also includes sketches of John Gottschall on evolutionary theory and Blakey Vermuli on fiction and free indirect discourse. And I quote the author of this um, article. He says, literature, like other fields, including history and political science, has looked to the technology of brain imaging and the principles of evolution to provide empirical evidence for unprovable theories. Gosh, that, that made me set up. Unprovable theories? <laughs> what's, what's going on here? Um, is it in the sense that literary critics, uh, as, as some of us have complained, that literary critics are in the habit of making assertions about literature which can't be proved or disproved? Unless it's until now, for example, if we bring some brain science, such as theory of mind, to bear on fiction. Uh, here's another one. This is from the New York Times of 2010, entitled, Can Neurolit Crit Save the Humanities? Uh, this is a commentary by William Chase, a literature professor. And amidst discussion of the next big thing, he wonders whether studies in neuroscience will save literature, <laughs> 
after the failure of Marxism and French-inspired postmodernism, and I quote, those scientists hardly claim to have the answers. Theirs is a pioneering spirit, tempered by modesty about what they really know. Rather than naively assuming they have met their betters, English professors, I hope you're listening, professors out there, English professors might help those scientists by alluring them onto the truly complex networks of mind and imagination that words and words alone in all their intricacy can generate. So there's a job to do for the English professors there. But how likely is this given the nuance and fine texture of the literary text? given the subtle differences between readers. Uh, this is from Big Data Meets the Bard, uh, from the Financial Times of 2013. And it's a comment on Franco Moretti's extraordinary work, uh, where he runs what he calls a literary lab. Uh, and he believes that reading with computers is the future. Uh, and note, this is not reading in the familiar sense. It's mining texts for data literature being treated as data. And uh, I quote, uh, for digitally savvy academics such as Moretti, lit literary study doesn't always require scholars to actually read books. This new approach to literature depends on computers to crunch big data or stores of massive amounts of information to produce new insights. For instance, here's, here's one of their insights. Between 1740 and 1850, long titles to novels became increasingly scarce. <laughs> Matthew Lockers, um, sorry, Matthew Jockers, a member of this group says, we are reaching a tipping point. Today's students of literature must be adept at gathering evidence from individual texts and equally adept at mining digital text repositories, that is, combing through large bodies of texts. And uh, here's another article. This is uh, from um, Science and is called Red in Tooth and Claw Among the Literati. Uh, Gottschall, this is about Gottschall's work. Uh, Gottschall says the resistance to Darwinian lit, lit crit among literary scholars reminds him of resistance among religious groups to evolution itself. There's the fear that if you were able to explain the arts and their power scientifically, you'd explain them away, he says. Humanities are the last bastion of magic. Note that the magic of literature gets little attention in these accounts. Confronting that magic with evolution or with big data seems to have aroused anxieties over whether literature will survive at all. And to cite Jockers again, now that literature is beginning to reek of science, there's a knee-jerk reaction against it. We can't win. There's an endless battle between the disciplines. <coughs> I am still repeated, repeatedly accused of taking the humanity out of the humanities. Here is another account of where we are now as literary scholars, and this is from a review of a book by John Gottschall. There is broad agreement that the discipline is in crisis. This is, that is, it is aimless, that its intellectual energy is spent, that all of the trends are bad, and that fundamental change will be required to set things right. But there is little agreement on what those changes should be, and no one can predict which way things will ultimately tip. So there's a lot of people out there who think we've got a serious problem. Um, okay, the next section is called Two Paradigms. But what will change, if anything? What will the new literary discipline look like? Will it enable us to accomplish what we cannot currently achieve or are not interested in achieving? Here I would suggest that, the two, parady that two paradigms are emerging and that we need both for a mature science of literature that will generate significant new knowledge. And I would characterize these briefly in their current state as one, empirical, and two, cognitive. In the first, we are engaged primarily in collecting data about the impact of literature on its readers, through which we will learn more about what features of the literary text influence the reading process, how literature makes its impact. And research designs, that is, what data to collect and how, are often adapted from previous psychological studies. <coughs> 
In the second paradigm, the, we speculate about how a literary text achieves its influence on the reader, drawing on pre-existing models of text and cognition. And these have normally already been validated by prior psychological or neuroscientific or linguistic study through models such as theory of mind, narrative theory, evolution theory, empathy or discourse models. Each has prototypical structures and processes that can be mapped onto some of the main features of a literary work. Sometimes these two paradigms come together. Uh, see, for instance, recent empirical articles on empathy in our new journal, SSOL, Scientific Studies of Literature. But for the most part, they proceed independently, the cognitive providing insights that will assist in developing interpretations of a given text, the empirical helping deepen our understanding of the reader and the reader-text relationship rather than facilitating understanding of the individual text. Both paradigms are vulnerable to problems. The personal bias of the literary critic in arriving at an interpretation is not held in check because a science scientific framework is adopted to underline the work. Meanwhile, empirical work calls for adequate theorization if the data is not to seem trivial. Whether either or both of these approaches to literary scholarship will be powerful and attractive enough to overcome the current crisis uh, in hum departments of English and humanities remains to be seen. The cognitive approach has so far won more favor among literary scholars. For instance, the MLA, the Modern Languages Association, now features a discussion group called Cognitive Approaches to Literature at its uh, annual conference, and several books in this area uh, have been published. The approach to the empirical paradigm is perhaps more problematic for the literary scholar because of the technical, that would be usually the statistical competence required. As evolutionist Gottschall puts it, we need help from experimentalists, expertise beyond what most of us literary scholars have. Uh, okay, the advent of science. But I'll argue that whatever may happen to literary studies, it should be impossible for literature itself either to change radically or to disappear. I will argue that literary scholars value, I will argue that literary values are inherent. We are born with them and they will endure and remain available whatever scientific work with literary texts or their readers that we conduct. This has been so for over two and a half thousand years or more since the discussions of Aristotle, Horace, Longinus. Whether engaging in the experience of literature itself or in analysis and criticism of literature, literature will remain important to us. It will survive as a key part of our culture and its magic will remain beyond assault or deprecation. We cannot fundamentally change it or delete it because its sources are cognitively impenetrable. The magic may move us or disturb us, but it lies beyond our grasp. As Lee Siegel comments, there are sonnets by Shakespeare that no living person can understand. The capacity to transfix you with their language while hiding their meaning in folds of mind-altering imagery is their rare quality. But what is the value of a scientific approach? Does it help us explore the experience of literature? that is, the ordinary reader's or listener's response? Does it facilitate redesigning what we teach and how we should study literature? In both of these contexts, how does science fit in? Does it replace what we are already doing? I've no doubt that we are now seeing the emergence of these new paradigms. I mean, certainly at this conference, uh, and among other locales. Uh, we've seen the emergence of these new paradigms for literary studies not only in newspapers and popular magazines, which are taking account of them. Uh, we have a new scholarly journal, the one that I mentioned, um, Scientific Studies of Literature, which started publication in 2011. And this follows the found founding of EGLE, the Empirical Study for, of Literature, in 1987. In addition, we have already worked with the IAEA, the International Association of Empirical Aesthetics, that regularly offers empirical studies of literature at its annual conferences. Cognitive and neuropsychological studies are indeed indexed at the New Humanities website of Grazia Pulverenti and Renato Gambino. Okay, the, the assault on science. 
The SSOL mainly contains reports of empirical studies of literary reading. Recent topics include response to differences between conventional and non-conventional metaphors, the role of insight and catharsis, the influence of textual features in understanding a narrator, and differences in reading due to the gender of the reader. Note that these are studies of important components of the literary text. They are not studies in the interpretation of specific works of literature or the works of a given author. So, you know, how threatening is that? Do empirical and cognitive approaches such as these destroy what is particularly literary about literature? Is scientific method with its commitment to reason and mathematics and the empirical incapable of seeing literariness? Many have thought so. Keats, for example, and I'm quoting here a passage from Lamia, well known. Philosophy will clip an angel's wings, conquer all mysteries by rule and line, empty the haunted air and gnomid mine, unweave a rainbow. And by philosophy, of course, at this period in the early 19th century, Keats means science. Uh, you'll recall that science as a term wasn't invented until about 1830. So it'll unweave a rainbow. And um, the artist Hayden records in his diary that at a di dinner party held at the end of December 1817, Keats and Lamb agreed that Newton, I quote, had destroyed all the poetry of the rainbow by reducing it to a prism. We drank Newton's health and confusion to mathematics. <laughs> and consider Blake's color print uh, of Newton and the compasses, uh, often mis misinterpreted. Uh, and there's now a statue of it outside the British Library in London. As Ian Wiley puts it, Blake's portrait evokes the spiritual form of Newton, a figure of energy and beauty who is fixed in a two-dimensional world concerned only to pin down the heavens with measuring protractors. Yeah, how tiresome. <laughs> um, Jack Stillinger, in his edition of Keats' poetry, uh, recites a lecture by Hazlitt given in January 1818, which Keats probably attended. It cannot be concealed, says Hazlitt, that the progress of knowledge and refinement has a tendency to circumscribe the limits of the imagination and to clip the wings of poetry. The province of the imagination is principally visionary, the unknown and the undefined. The understanding restores things to their natural boundaries and strips them of their fanciful pretensions. Hence the history of religious and poetical enthusiasm is much the same and both have received a sensible shock from the progress of experimental philosophy, that is science. So the anxiety is a more general one. As Christoph Koch puts it, in his book, Consciousness, Confessions of a Romantic Reductionist. Many people, says Koch, believe that science leeches meaning out of human actions, hopes and dreams, leaving desolation and emptiness in their place. Whereas for him, explaining consciousness is a kind of romantic quest. And these comments echo others made during the romantic period and since. Does science, in its work of analysis and explanation, destroy what the artist has created? So, becoming scientific. Here, yeah, we, we are now seeing arguments that a scientific approach should become the ruling paradigm in literary studies. For instance, here I quote again, John Gottschall proposes the adoption of scientific methods, theories, tools, and the insistence on hypotheses and evidence as the solution to the ailing condition of literary studies. Literature professors, he argues, should not only know more about science, they should do the science. And suppose science did become one of our standard approaches. What would it offer? What would be the point of such studies? Would it situate us once again in relation to prevailing ideologies? gender, race, class, with their focus on interpretation? Do we need more such studies? Or are there alternatives that science would make more central, such as studies of language, including phonetics, stylistics, and related formal aspects? Or authorship through digital investigations, such as John Burroughs' work on the idiolects of Jane Austen's characters? 
or reader response considered as experience rather than interpretation. Have we had enough interpretations? Um, if we are to consider science, then here are some of the fields we would need to include. Uh, the behavioral and other empirical studies following standard research designs as in experimental psychology, the kind of studies I mentioned that are now appearing in uh, SSOL. Cognitive poetics and linguistics, mapping the mind in the light of literary forms and reader response, and the use of cognitive theory towards interpreting texts. And to note, by the way, a mention of emotion that came up uh, in, the, in the last speaker's uh, discussion, um, that um, Margaret Freeman and Peter Stockwell, both prominent exponents of cognitive poetics, have both recently made moves to incorporate emotion <coughs> in their uh, systems. Neuropsychological, um, exploratory studies based on the technology of ERP or fMRI, uh, and for instance, uh, Norman Holland's recent book, Literature in the Brain, um, and then evolutionary approaches, which ask what advantages were conferred by literature in the ancestral environment. Uh, this would include Ellen Dissanayaka's work on developmental aspects as central to aesthetic appreciation, uh, Brian Boyd on narrative, Joseph Carroll's evolution and literary theory, and his more recent work. Uh, and then lastly, digital techniques for analyzing data about literature, such as its historical distribution, readership issues, a creative environment for hypertext fiction and beyond, uh, and scholarly studies in the digital domain are usually interpretive. Uh, and here we would include uh, Franco Moretti, uh, as we mentioned earlier. But rather than set out now to illustrate these various approaches and consider what they have to offer, I will shift attention to my main topic, literariness and scientific study. Does such study unweave the rainbow? I will put forward 10 propositions that contribute towards a model of literariness. Note that each of the 10 fields is amenable to empirical study and each involves the experience of literariness. But I will pay attention in particular to two in order to show how empirical methods are devised and applied to investigating literariness. So there are 10 propositions uh, and I'm not going to discuss all of these. Um, I will hope to mention some of them again in passing but to concentrate in a moment on two in particular, the first one, that uh, the claim that literariness is distinctive, uh, and the third, that literariness is recognized spontaneously without training. Um, okay, none of the propositions is adequate on its own, but taken together, applying a number of them to specific cases, they may help to find some of what is distinctive about our experience of literariness. But notice that the theoretical proposals I put forward come from the literary domain, not primarily from cognition. The procedure in which we adopt some insight from cognition, then use the literary example to interrogate it, may put at risk precisely that which is literary. Our research should rather begin with the proposals emerging from liter literature, from literary experience, and then turn to cognitive, neuropsychological, or other methods where where it is appropriate to explore and test them. And the 10 preposition, propositions I will present refer to a series of literary issues that are amenable to scientific study with different paradigms motivating the empirical framework from anthropological at one end to stylistics at the other. Uh, my approach will be somewhat idiosyncratic, emphasizing feeling and imagination as, as those are the uh, areas where I've done the most work myself. So if we turn to the first of them, that literariness is um, intrinsic. To look at the proposals in more detail then, the first and perhaps most important feature is that literariness is distinctive. This is to claim that our encounters with a particular body of texts endow us with experiences that occur uniquely in response to those texts. Unique not only to what we think of as literary, but unique to that particular text in the sense that we can never have another Middlemarch, say, or the Wasteland. This claim can be contrasted to the constructivist position that texts are constituted as literary by the way we are taught to regard them, which implies that there is nothing intrinsic about literariness. 
So, for example, in Terry Eagleton's words, anything can be literature. And anything which is regarded as unalterably and unquestionably literature, Shakespeare, for example, can cease to be literature. In Eagleton's view, educational and entertainment media exercise hegemonic control over what is literature, that is, what furthers their ideological purposes. Hence, the rules for what is literary can be rewritten at their behest. Our proposition here argues that such social control is illusory. Literariness is an experience, as an experience demonstrates a high degree of autonomy, able to appeal directly to the aesthetic and cultural responsiveness of its audience without the intervention of commercial, political, or academic interests. How then can we study distinctiveness empirically? The procedure I will demonstrate is to break down the question into its components. We can specify that literature language must be literary, and this is one approach, being constituted in part by literary features such as discourse style or figurative language, although attempts at identifying literariness on formal grounds, as Jacobson claimed to do, have not been convincing for most critics. Thus we isolate a feature of the text which contributes to its distinctiveness, which recurs, which is measurable, and for which we can obtain the responses of readers by such um, means as ratings, or semantic differential, or readers' comments analysed later. Or we find clues to literariness by calling on two different populations of readers, such as novice and expert. For example, several empirical studies demonstrate that literary language is readily identifiable and that what distinguishes it for a reader is recognition of tone. One genre that is, that is sounds different from another and sounds different from everyday discourse. Uh, and I will mention a couple of studies um, by um, Michael Malcolm Haywood and uh, Michael Ramskar. Malcolm Haywood made short extracts from literary and from historical texts and was able to show that participants could distinguish one genre from another with around 80% accuracy, even when the extracts were as short as five words. Another study by Michael Ramskar and his colleagues showed that readers who were frequent readers of literature were sensitive to minor changes in phrase and word frequencies characteristic of literary texts. These are just two examples of what in all probability are a constellation of language features yet to be studied that discriminate literary, or would help us to discriminate literary from non-literary texts. So here's my overview of the two empirical studies that appear to support this contention. Um, Haywood, uh, here's the uh, reference and some results which I'll mention. So Haywood's paper, uh, which dates, as you can see, from 94, describes an experiment testing the ability of readers to recognize the genre of a work given very small sample passages of only 5 to 15 words. These were taken from randomly selected texts of history or fiction. Readers showed a high degree of accuracy in this task, achieving up to 79% correct responses with five-word passages. This suggests that genre is deeply embedded in a work and recognizable at the micro level of the text. The ability to recognize genre was found to be independent of the subject's educational level, but dependent on the genre itself, since fiction was recognized more accurately than history. In a second run of the experiment, a survey was administered aimed at learning what participants looked for in guessing genre and the survey found that tone was a major factor in the decision process. The materials of his study were 20 passages chosen at random from works of history and 20 passages chosen at random from fiction texts. Passages varied from 5 to 15 words, and the order of presentation of passages was randomized. There were 45 participants at various levels of literary expertise from undergraduates to faculty members. And the, experience, the experiment was self-paced on a computer screen where particip participants pressed a key, either H or F for history or fiction, on the computer to register their decision and proceed to the next passage. 
Even with passages of only five words, subjects were able to identify them correctly, as I have mentioned, 79% of the time. And taking the combined scores of both genres, that's fiction and history, scores tend upward with the number of words available to a high of 91% at 14 words. And those are the figures you can see on the screen, I trust. Yep. It may be concluded, Hayward says, that almost any individual sentence in a work of fiction or history bears within itself at least some distinguishing features of the genre from which it came. In terms of genre difference, readers correctly identified a text as being from a work of fiction 88.8% of the time overall, while historical works were correctly identified as history 74.1% of the time. There are two implications following from this study which point to the distinctiveness of the literary text. And I quote in part from Hayward here. One, uh, part of every reader's competency in approaching a text seems to be sensitivity to tonal differences which signal a specific genre, whether literary, historical or other. It might be worthwhile exploring when and how readers acquire this competency, for certainly it is not one that readers are specifically taught. And then secondly, readers, perhaps even very inexperienced readers, gain a tacit understanding of generic markers and can interpret these clues appropriately. Such a skill might be based upon a recognition of particular formal characteristics which make up text. Distinctiveness is thus so far a combination of the reader's generic competence with the presence of formal features in the text. The study of Remscar et al points in the same direction, although it is not a study of genre differences. Uh, Ramsgar is interested in the features of language when they occur within a literary text. Uh, and uh, I think what I'll give you is just the abstract of his study, um, so that I have a little time left to do a couple of other things. So, uh, and you'll recognize perhaps a certain parallelism with the uh, Hayward study I just described. So his ab abstract is, here we examine how reading habits affect judgments of writing quality by looking at how readers' experience with reading shapes their sensitivity to the distribution of words in different texts, and how this in turn may shape what they recognize as good writing, that is, literary writing. We manipulated literary and non-literary passages so that the modified ver versions had lower word chunk frequencies, that's to say phrase lengths, but higher individual word frequencies than the original, and asked subjects to rate the quality of writing in each passage. The readers who participated in the study were either frequent or infrequent readers of literary texts. And results indicated that subjects who read more literary texts rated original literary passages higher, while non-literary readers preferred modified versions. Literary and non-literary readers, literary readers alike, rated the original versions of non-literary passages higher. Okay, and um, there's a graph here which um, helps to summarize what's going on. And uh, you can see the literary readers who are shown in blue here uh, uh, register quite a high level of appreciation of the literary passages, but lower for the non-literary passages uh, in the blue bars there, while the non-literary readers are somewhat the reverse for the literary passages, they find them uh, less interesting uh, and they're more responsive, as you can see, to the uh, non-literary passages. Uh, okay, in summary, when reading literary texts, literary readers preferred the original passages, which were in keeping with the genre, whereas non-literary readers did not preferring passages containing words that were likely more familiar to them. However, when reading non-literary texts, both literary and non-literary readers preferred the originals. These results indicate that literary texts require readers with a trained eye to detect subtle differences in chunk frequency, that's to say phrase length. Somewhat as in the Hayward study, the set of findings here points to a capacity for detecting literariness most apparent among those who were frequent literary readers. Whether this aptitude was derived from earlier training in the classroom was not investigated. 
However, the word and phrase manipulations that were the focus of participants' judgments are unlikely subjects of classroom instruction. The skills demonstrated by this study may be originally innate, but they, do have perhaps, but they have perhaps been enhanced through frequent literary experience. Is there evidence here that literary texts are distinctive? If so, and if readers, or at least some readers, can respond to features that are distinctive to literature without training, what is the origin of such a capacity, and what benefit, if any, does it bring to the individual reader? There's certainly scope for more studies there. Um, okay, I'm going to skip the transcultural. You'll remember that, um, uh, you may remember, Patrick Colm Hogan has written an influential article on that, which was recently reprinted in one of Lisa uh, Sunshine's volumes. Um, this is a place called Hardwick, as you can see. Um, it's the name, uh, the true name of the village where um, uh, the author Richard Hillier was born in 1901. Um, okay, uh, what I'm talking to here is the notion that literariness is recognized spontaneously. So um, this is based on work by Jonathan Rose. Um, he notes that working class readers, and this is during the 19th century and early 20th century, uh, are said to have no interest in reading the literary classics. As Rose puts it, this is a theory that has no visible means of support. He, he has surveyed, surveyed a wide range of memoirs by working class readers many of whom relate how at an early age, with no literary training, they found themselves able to read canonical literary texts with great pleasure. And I cite an extract from one of the accounts that Rose mentions. The author, Richard Hillier, born in 1901, was the son of a cowman in a poor area of Northamptonshire, uh, a village called Byfield near Billington, which he um, renames from Hardwick. Uh, he attended elementary school in the village until about 11 years old. Hillier says the lessons meant nothing to him, but the teacher, Mr. Wickens, had a question period on Wednesday afternoons, and Hillier asked what a poet laureate was, a term he had seen in a newspaper. And the question interested Wickens. So, and here I quote, for 10 minutes he let himself go on it, and education began for me. There was Ben Johnson, the butt of canary wine, birth diodes, and all the rest of it. I was fascinated. My mind was being broken out of its shell. Here were wonderful things to know, things that went beyond the small utilities of our lives, which was all that school had seemed to concern itself with until then. Knowledge of this sort could make all times and places your own. In addition, the children were allowed to choose from a small library of books for half an hour's reading on Friday afternoon. And among them, says Hillier, were a few poems of Tennyson, printed on brittle brownish paper with a gaudy cover. It said on the title page that he was poet laureate, and that set me wanting to read them. The coloured words flashed out and entranced my fancy. They drew pictures in the mind. Words became magical, incantations, abracadabra, which called up spirits. My dormant imagination opened like a flower in the sun. Life at home was drab and colourless, with nothing to light up the dull monotony of the unchanging days. Here in books was a limitless world that I could have for my own. It was like coming up from the bottom of the ocean and seeing the universe for the first time. Notable in Hillier's comments here are remarks that anticipate more recent approaches to literature the text world theory, the pleasure and literary language, especially imagery and sound, uh, what he calls incantations. So I think it would be of interest to conduct a stylistic analysis of this and other extracts from these memoirs of reading to establish what aspects of poetic language appear to be occurring as if naturally to these readers. An empirical study could draw upon cluster analysis or similar techniques to identify classes of reader comments and text features. These extracts and others like them, um, I mean there are quite a few in Rose's book that need looking at. Uh, these extracts and others like them suggest that literariness is intrinsic to our experience of language. Literary reading is waiting to be discovered. In some experiences the key to literariness is provided by narrative, 
in others it is poetic language, and sometimes it is both together. And for some readers, the experience will occur when they are children. For others, it may be when they reach young adulthood. Although the experience is not empirical in the strict sense that we described earlier, the conditions surrounding it demonstrate a total or almost total absence of influence from other readers, teachers or friends. We can note that also in some cases, on some issues, the accounts replicate themselves with similar comments about style, for instance, being offered by more than one reader. In addition, the trials of interpretation are largely avoided by most of these writers' accounts of how literary reading was discovered or what it came to mean for that uh, reader. Although we are not at this stage dealing with large quantities of data, the accounts collected by Rose possess an empirical validity which entitles us to consider them worthy of scientific study, as in the cluster analysis approach which I mentioned. The conclusions we can draw can be regarded as further evidence for the survival of the literary experience in its perceptible distinctiveness. Okay, I think I want to mention um, one or two um, key points from the other propositions, which you'll remember there are 10 of them. I hope you memorize them all. Um, that the literary experience is inborn. Um, th this kind of backs up what I was saying as a result of Hillier's work. Uh, so the fourth proposition is that literary experience is inborn and matures with age and less disrupted. And this is a claim made by Ellen de Sinaica in several places. Uh, this is demonstrated by the pleasure that the infant of a few weeks old takes in baby talk, or motherese, as it has been called. Or, another example, the verbal ingenuity of Ruth Weir's two-and-a-half-year-old son that he developed after he was put to bed. The growing child will continue to generate increasingly elaborate examples of language play unless this is disrupted by the experience of language as a formal acquisition in elementary school. Uh, the analysis of a mother-infant exchange or dialogue uh, for its poetic features uh, was something we analysed, uh, Ellen Disnaiker and I. It provides an example of the kind of empirical study possible in this domain. It shows the sensitivity of the infant to the sounds of the mother, the rhythms and the overall dynamics of her speech. Okay, so I think I should um, skip to my closing comment. Um, I'm sorry to miss out some of the propositions there, but we can um, come back to those if necessary. Uh, okay, so my last comment would be then that at some level works of literature remain impermeable to explanation while we continue responsive to their underlying states of being, their style, their ambivalence, and in particular the emotions and moods that they create. This is one way of thinking about the resistance of literature to the scientific approach, important though science is likely to be for understanding the power of literature, especially in empirical studies of the kind I've demonstrated. Science will, in a word, never supersede our responsiveness to literature or unveil its strangeness in a scaffolding of explanation and reasons. The rainbow will retain its place in the sky. Thanks. Thanks.